Our last track talk speaker for this afternoon is Bruce McKinsey, Mars Exports for Interplanetary Trade. Please welcome Bruce. Um, hi, thanks, folks. Um, so um, anyway, I've been in the Mars Society since the beginning and other organizations um, with some other people. I founded the Mars um, Foundation, and we did a homestead project design, which you'll see pictures of. And for years, people have been asking me, you know, why go to Mars? Um, you, know, you know, what will the, you know, why not asteroids? And it gets into conversations about what's going to happen in the distant future. Um, and so I've been thinking about these things for 20 years, but haven't really put them down on paper until I was as ex inspired by the, uh, by the challenge, the, 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 the Mars Society uh, colony challenge. And um, so I made a list of, of things that Mar Mars might export. And that grew into a, you know, a section in a paper, and then I made it into a PowerPoint. Um, I only transferred it from the paper to the PowerPoint last week and ho over the last week. So this is actually the first time I've seen these slides on the big screen. And I'm passing around three um, pieces of paper. If you're interested in following up on this or you want to join a Marspedia project, which Jim Burke will talk about, or if you want to join a settlement um, discussion group, uh, please put an email. So, so would you, se excuse me, you with the paper, separate the two sheets. Yeah, there's three sheets total. So, so give me an email address if you're the least interested. Okay, so this presentation assumes there are lots of people around the inner solar system. You know, some are mining asteroids, several people living on Mars. You know, there might be lunar hotels. And then growing beyond that. Um, okay, um, at some point, the governments are gonna stop paying for people to go for scientific reasons. And in order to get materials, so the Mars colonists, or, um, I should say settlers, will want to import various things they can't produce. What, how can they pay for that? They need to export something. And so, um, you know, how can Mars settlers ex pay for their imports? How could the orbital stations in low Mars orbit, Phobos or Deimos, pay for what they need to purchase? Um, now, there will be, there's an uneven distribution of resources around the solar system. A few, about 10% of the asteroids are nickel iron, but they don't have a lot of other elements. Other asteroids are carbonaceous chondrites. So if, you, if, you, if you're mining one asteroid or another, you'll need to import things and you can export them. Um, there's plenty of solar energy down around the Venus and Earth orbits, but um, places on the moon, you know, um, um, have a shortage of solar power for 14 days. So it's, it, it's those unevennesses that will lead to trade. There's also a big difference in where labor is. Labor will always be cheaper on Earth, but um, I think it will be more expensive in, say, an interplanetary craft where you have to import everything, including your food and water. So, so the cost of labor will be different. Okay. There we go. Um, I want to digress for a minute. Whenever I give a presentation to a general audience, I try to include three slides that say why go to space and why go to Mars first. And um, I, I know this is preaching to the choir, but those of you who give presentations, try to always include that. My reasons are here, um, benefit of the future generations, expand their horizons beyond the Earth, survive global catastrophes. Uh, the global catastrophe refers to the globe of the Earth. So if you're away from the globe of the Earth, you can't, by definition of the word global, survive a global catastrophe. So, you know, no matter what happens to the Earth, you know, some asteroid hits it or, or plague or something, um, people away from the Earth have a fair chance of surviving. And learning to manage ecosystems is a big one. If we have hundreds of ecosystems, artificial ecosystems around the solar system, we'll learn to manage them better. And we're not doing a good job here on Earth. Um, I'm a firm believer that someday um, lots of people will be living from 
in orbital settlements from asteroid material, Jerry O'Neill's plans. Um, look it up. Um, I, and um, anyway, he figured that there's um, enough material in the asteroids to build millions of space settlements and the total land area inside would be 3,000 times the Earth's land area. I see someone shaking your head. <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, the reason I want to start on Mars is, th is three reasons, food, food, and food. <laughs> um, on Mars, you have easy access to water to grow food, easy access to carbon that the plants need, and nitrogen for fertilizer and nutrients. Protein has a lot of nitrogen in it. And it, there's other reasons as well. So. Anyway, now, so much for the general talk. Now back to the main topic. Um, that was not good. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, I must, it's really hard to come up with things that you would export from a Mars settlement to the Earth. You know, maybe souvenirs. Um, it'll be a challenging environment, so they may, um, come up with new inventions, intellectual property. Um, for a while, they'll just be supporting scientific basis. Um, one way to get income is set, selling Mars land and habitats to new arrivals. Um, that's not really an export, but it is a source of income. Um, if there's, if you don't understand something I say, um, you can interrupt and I'll try to clarify, but otherwise let's hold questions to later. And there's far too many topics to, you know, to, to uh, talk about. Okay, I'm assuming that we have a viable, um, more or less self-sufficient settlement on Mars. Um, within the Mars, we, we worked on the Mars hillside settlement, which you see there. This is within the Mars Foundation and, Hill, and Homestead Project. And then we have, an, so this was, a lot of masonry would start with 12 people and grow. Uh, this would start with two people and then quickly up to 20 or more. And it'd be, this would be fiberglass construction, uh, locally produced fiberglass with polyethylene, thanks to Frank Crossman over there. I, I'm sorry, polyester. And um, you'll see later we have reasons for travel, um, especially to go, f the, so this, this settlement might be an, at an ice deposit maybe 40 degrees south latitude. And you'll see later that we want to get to the equator. So um, we need at least a, a surveyed track for vehicles to carry stuff. And um, we also need to be producing polymers like high density polyethylene you saw a couple presentations ago and fuel. By the way, carbon monoxide is an acceptable fuel. ISP is not great, but it's um, it, you, you don't need to consume water to produce it. So carbon monoxide and oxygen was actually um, proposed for one of the early missions. Um, and uh, I'm assuming you'll be growing a lot of food. By the way, um, that's the, uh, the masonry is inside the, uh, our proposed hillside settlement. We actually were going to make it out of masonry and cover it with dirt. Uh, that's going to be the topic of a, another presentation tomorrow. Okay. Um, up in the upper right is a proposed elevator, space elevator hanging down from Phobos toward the Martian surface. If you have carbon nanotubes um, um, in, 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 in good you know, production and, and usable, you could extend it all the way to the Martian atmosphere or close to the Martian atmosphere. Um, and even if you don't, you can, you can extend it far enough to be useful. Um, I actually did a little work on space tethers and elevators, and I had an interactive, um, you remember the overhead projectors, those transparencies? I, I, I had an interactive one. I taped a piece of space tether onto my overhead transparency. I could move it around and let the audience see it move. This was before PowerPoint animations. So. And, and this is a design, just a simple, you know, a payload is shot up from the surface, catches a rope on a hook, and then it's pulled up the elevator. Um, there hasn't been a lot of work done in this area. So um, anyway, so, so this elevator would hang down from Phobos. There'd be others as well. And then up in orbit, you'd have various supply depots and um, 
greenhouses and other things in orbit. Um, but you'd have very cheap transport from the surface of Mars, unfortunately at the equator, up to, um, up to Phobos and then to orbit. Okay. Um, it, it, how many people have run into the concept of, a, of an elevator sticking off of a moon? Just, I, I don't know how much detail to go into. Okay, only less than a third, about a third of you, okay. So here is Mars and um, this inner red oval, no, no, I'm sorry, the, the black circle is Phobos's orbit, about 6,000 kilometers up. And this blue horizontal thing is an elevator hanging down toward Mars. There's another one sticking up. And it, um, I gotta use my notes. So um, these figures are from Leonard uh, Weinstein. And um, let's see, he said if you um, get down with, it, he was proposing down to 60 kilometers above the Mars surface. I think 100 or 200 is more le realistic. And you would have, uh, you see this um, gun, you can position a, you know, some kind of launcher on P Pavonis Mountain. That's one of the three large mountains. It's, it's right on the equator, right underneath Phobos. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, by the way, I personally worked on a proposal to shoot Earth satellites out of a New Jersey class battleship gun. <laughs> okay. Um, I was working at Draper Lab, the same people that did the Apollo guidance, and they had micromechanical gyros and um, GPS systems that could not only stand the acceleration of about 18,000 Gs inside the barrel of a 16-inch Navy gun, they could even measure the acceleration as they were being shot and use it to, to um, adjust the Doppler shift for the GPS. Um, <laughs> so anyway, you don't have to go nearly that fast. Um, okay, so the figures are to, uh, to launch off Pavonis, Mons, either with a gun or a catapult or electromagnetic launcher, and then catch the catch the bottom of the elevator. You'd only have to get up to 60, um, 60 to 200 kilometers, whereas to get all the way to Phobos, you have to get up 6,000 kilometers. A lot of fuel savings to go, you know, 100 kilometers instead of 6,000. And your velocity to catch the tip of that tether is... Um, half a kilometer per second to catch the tether compared to two kilometers per second to catch, to, to rendezvous with Phobos. Um, I have not checked Weinstein's numbers and uh, they need to be adjusted a little, but, but you get the, you know, you know, the order of magnitude, you know, one quarter the velocity and one tenth the height. So, okay. Um, by the way, this is a 1980s um, image proposal of mining Phobos and this picture up here of a BFR on Phobos looking up at uh, Mars has nothing to do with my presentation, but it's a neat picture. <laughs> so um, um, actually you would want to land equipment on Phobos to, 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 to deploy the elevator. So um, there's other things you can do. Um, there have been proposals since the 1970s for atmospheric scoops. They probably would be more feasible on Mars than on Earth. And somebody actually got a NIAC proposal uh, approved and funded to, to do it. You have these very narrow tubes and you scoop in very low, uh, whoa, 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 just barely into the atmosphere and, 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 and catch the air molecules and, and compress them. So there's another possible export that would be based at in orbit, but exporting from the Mars system. Um, I gotta go pretty fast. Um, Asteroid redirect is not new. Here's an artist's conception from the 19, um, about 1980 or late 70s of moving a continent killer asteroid near the Earth. They didn't do an environmental impact study. And you mine it and produce solar panels and space settlements. And here's a later version. Is, is Brian Verstek in the office? Anyway, the, the, Brian is the artist and he's here. So one of the things that Mars could do is help supporting mining of asteroids to produce space settlements. Um, okay, Mars can, Mars is a great place to get hydrogen, nitrogen, arg argon if you need it, and carbon, 
and you can export them in the form of water or ice, methane fuel, ammonia, um, you know, etc. If you export them in graphite tanks made from carbon in the atmosphere, then the graphite is useful too. Um, you, might, you might cannibalize those tanks and use them for other spacecraft. So I have this idea that there's an electromagnetic cannon or a compressed air, you know, CO, CO, carbon monoxide powered cannon on the mountain shooting graphite tanks full of methane and ammonia that's going to be sold to, around the inner solar system. Um, I think you're following me. I don't see too many blank <laughs> faces. <laughs> so, okay, so the, uh, the methane fuel can be used, of course, to fuel spacecraft returning to Earth, going on to asteroids, cycling between Earth and Mars. And um, I think that ammonia would be especially useful on the moon because you can burn it with lunar oxygen and get water to grow your plants, and it releases um, nitrogen that you, for a breathing gas. So the, here's one of the exports people don't, don't notice, don't mention much. And ask me about the, uh, if there's a fiction author in the room, I want to help you write a book called The Ammonia Runners. And I, uh, <laughs> talk to me afterwards about it. Um, methane is not only useful as a fuel, it's also useful as a way to transport hydrogen around the solar system. I think the next slide goes, nope. Um, everybody knows there's ice deposits on, on, on Mars, right? So we'd be located next to one of them. Here, this is one of the first ones they found. Um, they got a radar image with half a kilometer of ice um, right here. So the, 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 the manufacturing settlement and you know where you manufacture the polymers would be at, at the edge of an ice deposit. Um, Okay, so the blue marks up here are known ice deposits. Um, by the way, this is what I'm proposing, what I'm presenting here is, is kind of a works in progress. I'd really like help filling in details, filling in numbers, you know, you know t tell me what to cut out. For example, I haven't been able to find the um, latitude and longitude for any of these ice deposits. I'm, you know, I'm sure that the, uh, you know, the, Whoever mapped the radar, you know, knows where they are. But um, anyway, um, and um, so 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 you mine the ice. This is a methane generator test stand that was made by high school kids in Dallas about ten years ago. Whenever the Mars Society was in Dallas, and you electrolyze the water, you pipe hydrogen in here, the carbon dioxide from the Martian air in there. There's a catalyst that makes methane and water. You condense out the surplus water. Um, Jeff Greenblatt told you a better way an hour ago, but, but it, you can make rocket fuel. Ro high school kids can make rocket fuel. <laughs> you don't need to be a rocket scientist. And um, so anyway, so we'd have, uh, imagine this is a propellant depot or you're refueling a ship to go out beyond Mars with, with methane fuel. Um, so I mentioned fuel. Uh, one other th important use for um, fuel that isn't mentioned, you might be able to bring a, a Mars landing craft from Earth or from somewhere, bring it into Mars orbit, but, but it comes in empty. It's out of fuel. You can launch methane and liquid oxygen up this space elevator, refuel the lander before it lands with a powered thrust lander. This, this, this is not an export but it greatly reduces the cost of the imports. Um, uh, it, by the way, a lot of this is not my ideas. I'm just trying to con con you know, collect things together that lots of people have talked about. Um, okay, we've talked about fuel. Um, oh, this is a repeat of the earlier slide. I kept trying to delete that slide and it wouldn't go away. Um, Who's heard of Jeff Landis and Cloud City and uh, Star Trek? You know, the, the Cloud City and Star Trek, it's feasible. <laughs> but you do it on Venus. If you, um, this, this is kind of a fun aside, but Venus needs hydrogen. So we want to export hydrogen to Cloud City on Venus so that they can power this rocket when they want to leave. It's really hard to get off Venus as hard as Earth. It's about the same gravity level. But um, 
Okay, so where's my figures? Um, at 50 kilometers altitude in Venus, conditions are Earth-like. You have about one atmosphere, same, same pressure as Earth's sea level, and within a sort of same temperature range. And you can make a giant balloon in Venus, fill it with an oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere, which is a lifting gas. So if you put breathable air in a bag, you have a balloon that will lift, and you can build your houses inside it. Okay, so at least a couple people haven't heard of that. Look up Jeff Landis. Um, so I mentioned exporting in graphite tanks. You know, that's not that's actually fiberglass. Um, if the space elevator is power is is good enough, you could you could export fiberglass tanks too. Um, there's not a lot of carbon in the lunar soil, and it's hard to get the nitrogen. So um, you not only would ship methane and um, ammonia to the moon, but you might burn the tank it came in and feed that the resulting the carbon dioxide to your plants. Um, okay, I think the first successful lunar casino will serve food from Mars. <laughs> okay, I try not to read my slides, but that was worth reading. Um, it's going to be really expensive to import food to the, to the moon for the first casino, and it's going to be really expensive to grow food there, and they won't have orbital greenhouses set up. So when you go to, to, the, to the moon and, you know, open up your snack pack from the vending machine, it'll say, made, you know, grown on Mars. But um, at some point, it, 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 and the reason is that carbon dioxide and nitrogen are just more plentiful, and I think construction and power, uh, some forms of power will be cheaper on, on Mars. So my personal opinion is there'll be a window of time when it's cheaper to live on Mars than anywhere beyond the Earth. Um, but um, it may not last because they'll start getting orbital greenhouses. Okay. Um, and I think it, you know, I think if you have a working space elevator at Mars, it'll be, vi um, you probably won't have one at Earth. It's a lot harder because of the higher gravity well and space debris. So um, using that space elevator, I think it'll be cheaper to export goods, food and fuel from Mars than from Earth, at least for a period of time. And uh, anyway, at some point, the Martians might start manufacturing greenhouses in the in orbit around Mars and selling them, the, you know, you know, just as you know, North America sells airplanes. Um, so um, you would construct the small, durable components on the surface of Mars. You'd construct the the the, the giant components up in Mars orbit. You'd send the small, durable components, you know, through this launcher and up the elevator and teleoperate and assemble them in in Mars orbit and either sell the working greenhouses or, um, or sell food from them. Um, that's what I just said. Okay, I gotta move fast. Um, and at some point, Mars may be exporting components to make uh, large settlements and uh, orbital settlements and cycling craft. So here is a, my proposed cycling craft um, from 1988 by Carter Emmert passing by Mars. Um, other exports, um, uh, equipment to mine asteroids might be produced in the Mars area and then sent out further. Um, local use, um, we may be, um, so, so at, at one time in the past, you know, like mid 1800s, you could take the riverboat down the Ohio River to St. Louis, buy a Conestoga wagon and some farming equipment and head west and, and homestead. And I think that's gonna happen on Mars and elsewhere too. So here this couple is uh, just gotten married. They're, they're taking their Conestoga wagon west and the, the, uh, the robotic trucks have already delivered their, their initial Mars homestead and they're gonna set up an agricultural farm or a support base for a scientific, at a scientific site. Um, okay, go back. <laughs> I'm trying to go back. <laughs> Come on, go back there. Okay, and my address is at the bottom, phone number, and um, did I make it in time?
So um, presentation tomorrow on the Hillside Settlement. And then, yeah. Uh, use the mic if you can. Well, Let's just, use the it, mic. It, Wait, but where it, was the oh, question? He just, shout, he just shouted out. Uh, but but the second question goes to the mic. Yeah, do put your email addresses on those sheets. Okay, my suggestion is that you add to your slides with regard to things to generate cash for the Martin economy, tourism. Tourism, yeah, so th the suggestion is add to the slide tourism. Um, it's uh, It's like a minimum two year round trip probably more like f probably four years so um they they got to be tourists who can take a four years out of their job or or are retired but yes um it, by the way i mentioned retired um space might be a really nice place to retire in um, i've got a relative where every time she falls she has to be taken to the hospital for an mri to, you know because she's on 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 the blood thinners so-called and um, you, you fall slower on the moon and Mars, and you fall really slow in, in zero gravity. Um, and um, um, me medicine is different. Um, if, if you get third degree burns over both sides of your body, you don't have to be in bed. They can hang you by your thumbs. Uh, sorry to put that on video. <laughs> yeah, Terry. Uh, yeah, hi, Bruce. I noticed that most of the exports that you mentioned were either of the nature of tangible goods or I think you also mentioned scientific information. But it occurs to me that Mars, once people are on it, it's, it's a ripe tree full of low-hanging fruit. And the first people there will be able to pick those low-hanging fruit. Like almost anything you could even think of to do, even if it's something dumb, somebody on earth would pay you to do it. Like you could crowdsource things, like the whole thing about the face on Mars, I know it's been long debunked, but there's still people that are fans of it. And how much money do you think you could crowdsource if you were already on Mars and say, you know, I'm gonna get my rover and take a ride over there and look at it. Would you people like to have you know, exclusive viewing of my videos I'm going to send um, back. It, it, Anything. Okay, okay, so, so, so videos, film, artwork back from Mars, anything unique, um, you know, you know uh, video of, of pole vaulting up incredibly high. Um, how about a hotel at the, at the face on Mars? Um, you know, that, that's one place that there might be tourists who want to go. Um, let me stress that, um, so, so I do think there will be intellectual property coming out of Mars because of all the challenges, and, and that might actually be a source of income. Um, but um, most trade is based on physical objects, either raw materials or finished goods. And I think that I think the cost of labor will be low, and therefore there will be some limited class of material, uh, of finished goods produced either on Mars surface or Mars orbit, tele, tele operated, that will be valuable at export. And um, I, I, by the way, there's a story, some of the first Europeans to, in South Africa were exploring a new valley and they made a campfire and it got dark and they start, saw little glitters of light in the ground all around them. And there were diamonds on the ground that were reflecting back from their campfire. So. We don't know what we're going to find. Well, yeah, to that, Olympus Mons is the largest volcano in the inner solar system, and diamonds are often associated with volcanoes, so that's a good place to go look. Okay. Uh, but I'm wondering about shipping from point to point. You're going to be dealing with fairly high shipping costs, and doesn't it make everything about the same price? If if you're sending, like for the space shuttle, a thousand dollars a kilogram to orbit, or ten thousand as it was, it doesn't matter whether you're sending up cheap wine or expensive wine. The shipping cost eats all of it. Um, so have you yeah. addressed shipping cost? Yeah, well, well, this whole thing is premised on, we, I, I, I should have said, um, with, for that space elevator, um, with carbon nanotubes, you can, send a, you can have a space elevator from Phobos right down to the edge of the atmosphere. But even with existing materials like that shoelace that I'm in the possession of, you can go up, up, you know, one or two kilometers down. And, and, and that makes it much cheaper 
to launch from Mars than to launch from Earth. So, um, yeah, we got five minutes. Yes, uh, I'm a Martian, and I can't tell whether you're raping my planet. Uh, <laughs> and you know, everything is gather this, gather that, send yeah. it out. But I have all this stuff that I can live on. What exactly do I need to sacrifice my planet, just like we sacrifice this planet, and we sacrifice South Africans for diamonds? Uh, wh where is the, uh, where's the level of rightness in this, um, correctness or justice? Well, okay, okay. It w the, the treatment of the native South Africans in the diamond industry was definitely wrong. I, I, I am not trying to defend that. Um, but... I think exporting material like fiberglass constructed items doesn't use up a lot of regolith. There's, there's plenty of regolith on Mars. Um, and it'll be a long time before we deplete much carbon or nitrogen out of the air. But, but you might want to keep track of it. You know, um, 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 I live in Boston, and there, um, there were native forests in the 1600s that were needed for the British ships because they had the, the tall mass. There were no tall trees left in, 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 uh, in, in England to build the, the sailing ships with. And so they, you know, they, they took a lot of tall trees out of New England. Um, was that fair? I, I don't know. Um, yeah, Qu question? Yes, you're talking about quite a while in the distance. Yes. By that time, you know, if you're going to the moon, you can stay awake the whole time. If you're going to Mars and you learn how to put people to sleep healthily and they wake up, they've eaten practically nothing on their 200 or 300 day trip, it's a whole new story. Yeah, so, so hibernation en route to Mars. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't even fit what I had into half an hour. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, may, maybe tourists would want to hibernate on their way there and back. Um, yeah.